Hello and a very warm welcome to another edition of Talking Germany, the show where we do just that. And I'd like to begin today's show with a question. What have Vladimir Putin, the former Pope, John Paul II, and the German national skiing team got in common? Well, the answer is that they all wear or wore skiing suits from the company run by today's guest. And here he is in person, Willy Borgner. Hello. <laughs> Thank you very much for joining us today. I can tell you appreciated the introduction. <laughs> Thank you for the nice introduction. <laughs> a good start. Now, Willy Borgner doesn't just run the sports and leisure wear company of the same name, Borgner. He's also had a fascinating life in which he has, for instance, skied in the Olympic Games and worked in a number of James Bond films. So I'm sure it's going to be very interesting to hear what he has to say about the following topics. Controversial colours, Willy Borgner and his designers are clothing the German team for the London Olympics in some catchy colours, but not everybody is happy. Risky business, many people here in Germany, including our guest, adopt children from abroad, but they need to be aware of fraud, manipulation and unscrupulous officials. And strange skiing. We go to the Thuringian Forest to have a look at some cross-country skiers who simply won't wait for the winter to have some fun. Billy Borgner, uh, sportsman, filmmaker and head of a very uh, successful sports leisure and fashion company. I think we've established all that, yeah? Yes. <laughs> My first question, in an age of global warming and financial crisis and terrorism and all these evils... What, why do we need fashion? Oh, it's a wonderful play field for us. And uh, it's expressing all our emotions and dreams and what we want to portray. It's, it's, it's one language, a very important language. You know that uh, people make the first impression of a person meeting them through how they dress. You know, the first two seconds, people judge people how they how they walk and how they dress. You've got me worried e now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're perfect for you know for Good. the financial district. For the financial district. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, go on. <laughs> so first impressions count. Yeah, and yes, fashion counts for that reason. It's, it's a, fun. A, a visual communication form, um, very important, mostly underrated. Underrated. A lot of people would say we are obsessed with fashion. I mean, my kids think, uh, they think much more than I did in the past about <laughs> what they look like, what they wear, and what little badge they've got on their shirt. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, they form kind of a group thing, you know, wearing the same thing, you know, like, like in, in football or in rugby, you know, wear the same <laughs> colours. It forms a group, yeah. and it's also belonging to a, a group of people that think... Uh, uh, the same way or uh, uh, similar ways. Okay, okay. Well, uh, I mean, you've been having a very close look at me and decided I look <laughs> like a failed banker. I'm looking at you, yeah? Uh, ah, there we have it. We know which club you belong to. Yeah? <laughs> you, you look very smart and very relaxed. You, you, look very, you look pretty underdressed for the head of a fashion empire. You know, fashion is, sportswear is fashion. Uh, Fashion used to be, you know, the evening, the great evening gowns and then super elegant things, but they count, they don't count a lot anymore. It's how you're dressed in everyday life, how you're uh, dressed in the company, in, in, in social but, things, but, in sportswear. Yeah, but it, yeah, but sportswear. it confuses me, it confuses me. I mean, <laughs> you go to the opera these days and people are dressed as though they're going to a tennis match. Yeah, you're yeah, to blame yeah. for that. <laughs> <laughs> I hope they wear some of our stuff at the opera. <laughs> but but we have new freedoms, you know, to express ourselves in, yeah. in more open ways, and and this is great. Okay, I'm looking forward to your sports opera line. Yeah, there's a new business <laughs> yes. opportunity for you there. Okay, first impressions there from Billy Borgner. Here is more. At a photo shoot for his new fashion collection, Willy Borgner pulls out all the stops. The boss takes the pictures himself using a 3D panoramic camera. Ice caves located at an elevation of 3,000 meters form the backdrop for his fashions, and Bugna treats spectators to daring stunts. Bugna's trophy collection reflects his success in sports, fashion, and film. This is so Versatility is my credo. We're all so versatile. 
So, coming from a sports background, I've always tried to bring film and fashion together. It's the mixture that makes every person special. In the 1960s, Willy Bogner was one of West Germany's top skiers and took part in two Olympics. He's always been a real go-getter. Bogner later worked as cameraman on several James Bond films, shooting, for example, this spectacular chase scene along a bobsled track. Bogner also produces his own films, which show skiing in an entirely new light. His movie, Fire and Ice, released in 1986, was a huge hit. In 1977, he took over his parents' textile company in Munich. Together with his wife, Sonja, he's turned it into a global player in the sportswear business. Nowadays, the Bogna company produces many high-quality, expensive sports clothing. A hand-embroidered Bogna ski jacket can sell for as much as 6,000 euros. It's all about making our brand emotionally charged, about telling people how Bogner differs from other firms. It's about images and feelings. The Bogners have been outfitting Germany's Winter Olympics team for 75 years now. This year, for the first time, the company will also be supplying clothes for the Summer Olympics. Bogner is working with top German ski star Maria Höfer-Riesch on a new fashion line. Her first collection for Bogna was shown in late January. Film, fashion and sport. In his world, they belong together. And today, he's our guest on Talking Germany, Willy Bogna. <laughs> Shouldn't talk with my mouth full. <laughs> <laughs> You're a bad boy. Yeah? Yes. Um, <laughs> the, the thing that caught my eye most there, initially at the beginning of that report, was you in that pullover looking so very young and handsome, yeah? 18 years old. 18 years mm -hmm. old, and you're skiing down the mountain. And I'm thinking, well, what a lovely pullover and what an interesting looking guy. And then you suddenly tell me that was the Olympic Games. Yes, yeah, Scorelli, 1960, you would, yeah. you would uh, actually race in a sweater, you know, looking like... So it's unbelievable. Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but at the time, uh, you know, there was kind of the, uh, the art, you know, yeah. and uh, nothing so much developed as it, it, as it is today. Incredible memories, that terrible fall, yeah? Um, no, no, there's a story behind that. The fall well, you saw cost yeah. me a gold medal. I was, I was exactly. leading one second after the first run, yeah. you know, as an 18-year-old guy from and, Munich. And try and recreate, what were you thinking after the first run? After the first run, say, wow. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I, better, I better ski well the second run. Yeah. And then I crashed. So, that's sports. What were you thinking then? I'm an asshole. <laughs> <laughs> it's out, it's Sorry. in the open, there we are. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Let's rewind. Let's go. Work. You were born in 1942 mm -hmm. in Munich, the capital of Bavaria. Uh, and although you were very young, uh, a tiny toddler, you told me that you can remember the bombing raids over Munich. Yes, it's something you would never forget, you know, sitting in, in, the, uh, in the cellar and, and hearing, you know, the, the bombs crash and everybody really afraid. And then we, um, we left Munich and, and, and stayed in the country being away from that. But it's something even a three, four year old will never forget. Hmm. What do you do with that memory? Because you've got a memory, I haven't got a memory like that. It must uh, have some kind of an impact. No, it, it gives you the other side of this incredibly lucky life that we are leading now. Hmm. Uh, to be born now after the war it was a great privilege. You know, like our parents, grandparents, they all had to had these terrible uh, things happen. And we are really lucky to be born into a grow, growth period, yeah. you know, where, you know, peace is suddenly spread all over Europe. You know, the, the, the Eastern Bloc is part of, of, of us. Things that are, are incredible. Mm -hmm. and, and I think we have to be aware that we are really lucky in our generation. Our, our, our lifetime experience has expanded, you know, like 30 years uh, more than 100 years ago. Those things uh, we have to be aware of and, and be, be 
grateful for that. You know, your, your father and mother were so important in building up the company, the Borgner company, but uh, I mean, your father didn't have a fortunate life in that sense. I mean, he built up the company initially, yes. but then there were the war years. Mm -hmm, right. Mm. Tell us a little bit about your, your, your mother and father. Uh, obviously, my, my father had to go, you know, to the East Front also, as everybody else. And for my mother, you know, raising us kids, uh, it was, a, you know, a very d difficult time. Nobody had a lot to eat and you have to kind of organize yourself. And But then after the war, you know, she was the one that really uh, built the company up again and, and practically invented sports fashion, ski mm. fashion. Which is an amazing fact because as Which, we've seen it so prevalent in the world yeah, today. Yeah, you know, uh, and especially the ski pant, you know, the famous uh, stretch pant that yeah. made, you know, uh, really many women and many men afterwards come to that sport was practically a mention of my mother who wanted, uh, you know, women also to look good, not only the mm. men. Good for her. Uh, we've got to go back in time just a little bit, though, because uh, your father was already, by the, by the 36 Olympics, was kitting out the Winter Olympic team, the mm -hmm. German. We've also got that. The, that's your father, yeah? Yes. And he, What's going on there? He had the great privilege to uh, be called to speak the Olympic oath because, because he had won the, the German national championships in Nordic combined. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, uh, so everybody knew his name, which also helped him establish a business by importing skis from Norway, who at the right. time were the best. And obviously as a sportsman, he was more into hardware, skis and, and, and those things. And when my mother joined, um, she was more interested in clothes, like all women are. So she brought the style and he brought the sport. And this combination of sport and style is, is still our position as a brand. Okay, but if we go back in time, I mean, I think a lot of our foreign viewers will be putting two and two together. The, 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 the rise of the firm took place during the Nazi period and you, we, we saw your... Not, not really. Uh, okay. not, not really. The, the, at that time, it was just a ski importing uh, business and, and the rise came after, after the war. Uh, when people were open for new things and colours and people could, could be free again. Yeah. And... Uh, you know, inventing the stretch pants, being very successful in the United States. Uh, they were called Bogners, all stretch pants, which is a, is a great, great feat. Um, and for us growing up in that, you know, being also a part of that ski world uh, for young kids, it's wonderful to be out there also with the parents and, and, and becoming also a, a renowned skier and athlete, you know, how that feels. <laughs> it helps you grow up and take responsibility. But I always found myself extremely lucky also being born into that kind of sport because you're out there, you're, you're in, in the mountains. It's not, it's not just, it's the environment, it's, it's the beauty and the power of, of nature. Mm. And I've tried to actually... Uh, interpret this kind of feeling in my in my movies because if nobody likes skiing we can't sell them any clothes so I think we were responsible also for making people aware what be what beautiful sport that is and, and how many facets it has. Interesting stuff, interesting insights. Okay, this uh, uh, it, it's all gone a long way because this summer at the London Olympics, Borgner has uh, played a key role in the outfits that will be worn by the uh, German athletes. Uh, this is what those uh, those outfits will look like. The German team's Olympic dress code for London is nothing if not colourful. The athletes cut quite a dash on the catwalk in Dusseldorf. It's a shame there are no medals for appearance. One team but 50 different outfits. And there are stringent rules about who can wear what and when. The athletes aren't even allowed to choose their own socks. In the competition four years ago, we discussed what socks we had to wear. Those from the Athletic Association sponsor or those from Adidas. I bet there will be discussions again this year. The colour scheme isn't to everyone's taste. The women are wearing pink, the men sky blue. On the other hand, the jackets are reversible. Fencer Nicholas Limbach thinks that's a plus. What does he think is so advantageous? It's practical, isn't it? I can take one less article of clothing. How does it compare to Olympic kits from previous games? I think it's more daring in terms of fashion, but it's a change. I remember Beijing. There it was very simple and classical. This blue is something new. 
Would he wear it in private life? Um, I'd have to get used to it. I don't usually wear colourful clothing, but this complements it all. In addition to newcomer Bogner, Adidas is again responsible for some of the German Olympics kit. And all the designs go beautifully with gold, silver and bronze. Well, there's one English word that comes to mind for me, uh, is snazzy. Yeah. yeah which uh, sort of great. describes like the jackets. The jackets are cool, yeah? Who had yeah, that you idea? Know, you know, the, the, this moment, you know, the opening ceremony of Olympic Games is the most watched TV event in the world. There's 2.2 billion people watching. I mean, it's, it's, it's amazing. And at the same time, it's the biggest fashion presentation uh, there is, uh, you know, people are judging also the nations, how they look like, how, yeah. what, what their emotions are. And we, over, we do it now for the 17th time in the winter since 1936. You've, you've had the winter games yes. right down the years. Yes. And so, this is the first time for the summer yes, games. Yes, correct, which is wonderful for us. But we have kind of over the years educated also the sports people into a more daring uh, look, you know, oh, colorful look. Because, because they are conservative. Yeah, because, uh, you know, there you're on the stadium, it's a, it's a celebration, it's, yeah. n it's not business. You know? And there they can be free, they can be colourful. So we, we tried out very, you know, strong colours and, and we were rewarded with, you know, with, with, with very good results and the athletes themselves thought, you know, they were well dressed. No, no moaning. Well, you know, <laughs> with 800 people, you always have different opinions. Yeah. But in this case, you can reverse it to a very solid yeah, the jacket uh, is great. navy the jacket, jacket is great. white pants. Yeah. You can even go to a club yeah. <laughs> in London yeah. afterwards. Which is saying something. Yeah. Yes. Uh, um, so you can be very... My daughter is a bit of a sportswoman, a young right? sportswoman. Yes. Yeah? Uh, but she would not wear one of those pink jackets. Oh, it, it, it probably, uh, <laughs> if it's reversible and, and she oh. can, you know, she can choose, <laughs> you know, she has a choice. <laughs> Maybe in some occasions where you're not present, she would wear the coloured one. You think so? Possibly. Is, it, is that colour actually pink? Is that what you call it's it? It's pink. It's correct. pink. Yeah, it's, it's just a sort it's of a bit off there. pink, yeah? Uh -huh. Oh, it's uh, real pink. I mean, this is, you must be very tense because this is the opportunity of a lifetime for your company. You need to make the most of it. Of course. Are you going uh, to be there? Oh, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to cheer on and say, yeah. It, it's interesting for me how the other nations are dressed. Oh, know? well, that's the point, isn't it? Because yeah. I, I, I mean, I'm no expert on these things, but I read somewhere that the UK, or the GB team, I think, mm -hmm. the GB team is uh, Stella McCartney. Mm -hmm. yeah? yeah. Amani cool. and Prada yeah. are doing the Italians, sure. yeah? Ralph Lauren doing the US. Yes, yeah. of course. These are all people you know, I would guess. Yes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> At least by name. I know Ralph Lauren personally. And uh -huh. And, and I haven't met Stella, but, you know, these are companies that are worldwide uh, well-known and it's kind of a sporty competition out there. Exactly. Yeah, who's yes. going to get the gold medal or the pink yeah, medal getting, or the blue medal or whatever it is, yeah? Going to get the, the tens and the eights. How did you get this deal? Because this, this is part of what you're very good at. Uh, number one, we... As, as I said, we're part of the Olympic movement since a long time, being both athletes, my father and myself, we know all these people. We know, but we know what the athletes want, we know what the officials want, and what, what the whole job is. And we had experience over, over a few years to kind of work uh, from both the view of the athletes or the officials and the, uh, you know, the public look. So... And, and finding the quality to, to actually do that because mm. nobody ever did a reversible jacket like we do it in nylon that you can also wear when it's raining, you know, because sometimes mm, it might rain sometimes in London. It happens. <laughs> so, you know, people don't get wet and, and, and they, they don't get, catch a cold or something. Listen, you just, you just mentioned your father again there. Let's, let's talk a little bit about how those fashions that you... I mean, your mother and father had, a, had an innovative role in inventing sports mm -hmm. leisure fashions. Let's have a look at some photos and you could perhaps just give us a, a word on how sports fashions have changed mm -hmm. down the ages. It was the 30s, so the pants were still not stretch so so they would you know they would be wide but also uh, come together in on the boots so they, this was kind of the the, the first look of, of uh, the stretch pant 
And then uh, here you see the first uh, one-piece suit in stretch material that looks very modern. Now mm -hmm. this is the, the 70s, mm -hmm. where color became color, you know, important. Now that was my first line, yeah. the Formula W, and then we designed the ski with it. And, and, and that's a Wurlitzer design. Where you could press a button and hear music. And that, that is the Olympic team uh, marching in. In, uh, uh, could be... <laughs> With 17, you have to kind of paste it. I, th yeah. I think it was mm -hmm. uh, Salt Lake City. Salt Lake City, okay. Um, let's talk, I mean, you are very good at bringing together sort of adventure and, 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 and advertising. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> sure, he says. Yes. Let's have a look at some footage now, moving footage that we've got. Of, we're going to go now to 2002. There you go. Tell us what we're seeing there. <laughs> I got the fantastic opportunity to kind of direct and, and conceive the opening ceremony of the Brandenburg Gate that was, uh, after, after the reunion, was uh, repaired for eight years, and this was a great ceremony celebrating, uh, you know, the, the reunification East and West in Berlin at, at this wonderful Brandenburg Gate, which is the symbol of, uh, of East and West in, in where, where the wall went through. And reopening this, this door from East to West was, was a fantastic moment. And I could actually open the zipper of the Brandenburg Gate myself, which was, you know... And, which and had suddenly, the Borgner B on it, but could also have been the B for Berlin. Of course, or yeah. Brandenburg, or whatever. Yeah. You know. So we were lucky to have the same. But tell me again. Name. You said you said I got the opportunity to do this. It didn't just come, you know, flying your way through the post. Or... No. Well, I was known to be kind of a crazy guy uh, with, oh. <laughs> when it came to show and 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 spec uh, outdoor spectacles because we did a lot of you know films that happening doing doing outdoor things, uh, including some Bond films, and then. Uh, I was asked if if I could have an idea how to you know uh, run this and and people liked the idea and and there how suddenly it happened <laughs> to my great surprise the fun thing <laughs> go on the, uh, the fun thing was Bill Clinton obviously was the guest of honor uh, and um, oh so the B was for Bill <laughs> <laughs> the first idea was that he would actually open the zipper. Oh, yeah. But then, obviously, <laughs> after the Monica Lewinsky story, uh, the White House decided it was not a good idea to have Bill opening a zipper. <laughs> so so, that was so that. I got to do it. <laughs> so Bill I to... have to thank Monica Lewinsky for the job. There you go. From Bill yeah. to Borgner. Okay. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to talk about uh, something very different in a moment, but something very close to Willy Borgner's heart because he and his wife adopted two children from abroad. And it's never an easy process. And one concern for many people looking to adopt a boy or girl is the threat posed by shady middlemen and women. Leo was five when he came from Sri Lanka to Germany without understanding a word of the language. Now he's eight and lives with his adoptive parents in Bonn. In every way, it's a dream come true. I can't imagine anymore how it was without Leo. But that dream was a long time coming. For years, Susanna and Cord tried unsuccessfully to have a child. After 10 attempts at in vitro fertilization, they were over 40 and decided on an international adoption. Two attempts failed because of bureaucracy abroad. Years passed before the agency finally phoned. They spent five weeks in Sri Lanka getting to know their son. At the time, he was living in an orphanage in the jungle. It was love at first sight, but the parents are also realists. He suppressed many things from his time in Sri Lanka. We fully expect them to resurface when he's an adolescent. But right now, all three are simply enjoying the pleasures of a normal family life, no matter what the future brings. In contrast, Anisha Myrtle wants to find out after 21 years just what happened to her when a German couple adopted her as a baby in India. I'd never have imagined I was a stolen child. That was hard for me to take in. Now she's searching for those responsible for what turns out to have been an illegal adoption. Together with Arun Dola from the organization ACT Against Child Trafficking, she's visiting the Central Adoption Office in Mainz. 
This isn't easy for me because I'm still very emotional about it. After many inquiries, she's finally able to look into her adoption papers and make copies of some of them. She's shocked at how many people were involved in and possibly earned money from her trafficking, because adoption is a huge business. It's just appalling that it somehow works and that no one wants to be held accountable, that no one takes the blame. Ultimately, seeing the files raises even more questions. Much remains unexplained. At least Anisha's research has brought her back into contact with her birth mother. But she suspects she'll never find out the complete truth. This bracelet serves to remind her of her mother Fatima in India, who misses her. Anisha also misses Fatima. But the years have changed her irrevocably. I can't live in India. I'm too German. I couldn't live the way people do there. Anisha often writes to her mother. The letters are read to Fatima because she can't read herself. Even though neither mother nor daughter can turn back the clock, at least they've found each other again. Many adopted children search in vain. While we were watching that report, there was a very important point that you began to make, and I think you know you would like to make. Yeah. Um, adopting a child from an environment that is really terrible, uh, like we adopted from Brazil, there's two million people without parents. In Brazil, some of them have no chance. They end up in, in, in the slums, in, in the drug scene, and so on. So, and obviously my wife comes from Brazil, we, we were very close to that. And so let's just have a look at, the, we, we have a photo while you, of, of you and your wife, I believe. Let's see, there we are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the children there. Yeah. And, you know, we couldn't have children like many other couples yeah. and, and adoption was, was a very good option, especially also with the relationship to Brazil, uh, my, my wife coming from Rio. And we went there, we looked at it and we went through all the procedures and... Um, it's a, it's a fascinating but very difficult process for, for uh, parents who want to adopt. Obviously, some, you know, some bad guys are using that desire of people in a bad way, but look at the upside. There's, there could be thousands of children saved if the procedure would be uh, a little more similar to normal parenthood. Right now, you've got to gotta stop working as a mother to have, have a child. I think it, it, in, in our environments, this is not realistic. Mm -hmm. um, so if you just open that a little bit, you, I think we would help a lot of children without a future all over the world. And another, while I've been sort of thinking about adoption, preparing the, today's show, I was, I was made aware that, you know, in, within this industry or within this process, there, there are open adoptions and closed adoptions. Mm -hmm. And I hadn't really understood that distinction in advance. Could you perhaps just explain that? Well, there are very strict rules to, uh, for, for German citizens uh, if you can, can adopt a, a child. Generally, a German, you, you don't get German children adopted mm -hmm. um, un unless they are not healthy, uh, which is uh, also a very big problem. But there's millions of, of children out in the world, you know, that are waiting for, for, uh, for parents. And uh, it, it's a very difficult process to go through for, for the parents. Uh, it takes two to three years to really go through all the checks. Uh, I, I realize it's important and you want to keep the criminality out and things, which is fine. But on the other hand, in the interest of, of the children, it would be good to make it a little easier with, without, uh, you know, uh, making it too liberal. I think what, what we have found by saving these children, um, it's worth a lot. It's a, it's a wonderful thing you can mm. do with your life. I've been very impressed by how so you're a wise person, I find. <laughs> yeah? Thank and you're you. a very optimistic person <laughs> and a very successful person all together, the, the son that you adopted, he took his own life. And this must have been 
it's a terrible tragedy for you, and I don't want to pry into that, but I'm interested to get a, a full picture of you, how you balance those two kind of experiences in life, this, this huge success and good fortune, and then such a tragedy. There's a human lesson in there, I feel. Yes, we are all human. We are... Um, <laughs> we are all alive, not from our own uh, making, but we are subject to forces that are bigger than us. Mm. Some call it fate, some call it God, some call it other things. But we can control everything, but our job is to live with certain things. Obviously, there's nobody in this world that only has positive experiences, but the lessons, the real lessons, if you can still positive and and, and uh, having having gone through really tough times, I think this is very important. Mm. That is the lesson that we must learn yes. in life. It's Definitely. a it's a lesson that I have begun to you know feel mm. to, to be challenged with. I must learn this. It all happens to us sometimes. Yep. Life has many different phases, many different seasons. Yeah. Yeah. On the other hand, this makes the value of the good times especially. Uh, if there would be no downside, the upside wouldn't be there. Thank you for sharing that with Thank us. Thank you. Well, talking of seasons as I just was, let's have a, a quick look now, a light-hearted look, a change of tone at some uh, skiers, cross-country skiers to be precise, enjoying a bit of fun uh, out on their skis in the middle of summer. Sören Michael comes from the Baltic Sea coast. But when he's in Rula, in the low-lying mountains of Thüringen, he wants to go cross-country skiing. After all, the region is famous for it. The fact that it's summer doesn't bother him in the least. He used a sanding machine on them, so they were no longer usable in the winter. Doesn't that bother him? <laughs> I'm not paying for them. I don't buy stuff like this. But even the worst materials need upkeep. And if you're skiing in summer without snow, that can chip the skis. So there's an expert on hand with advice. We'll rub a little wax into the middle and give the front and back a quick going over. <laughs> Rula's summer skiing extravaganza was founded 10 years ago. There must have been a lot of alcohol involved when 11 people at a birthday party decided to put on their skis and glide through the forest. More and more people joined in. There were 34 of us the second year, then 60, and then we reached 100. Nowadays, it's all a big festival. Not everyone taking part can cope with the unfamiliar conditions. Cross-country skiing is evidently not that easy, especially with no snow. Still, all the participants finished the course unharmed, unlike the skis. But with any luck, there might be a few that will still be usable next time around. Huh. <laughs> Great. This is, where, this is where Monty Python would say yes. uh, something very different. Yeah? You like it? Cool, yes, wonderful. <laughs> Whatever way to have fun and, and, and enjoy yourself, do it. Do you, when you're looking at that kind of thing, do you look at how people are dressing? No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> Although, I mean, if the sport really took off, uh, would be <laughs> you'd be there. <laughs> yeah, it would be interesting to, to give them the right ski suit. <laughs> um, there's a serious point here because they're skiing in summer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you ski on artificial snow? Uh, there's no artificial snow. Oh, you see, <laughs> no. I thought there was. Yeah? No, it's just. Uh, it's just water being uh, being cooled down. Yeah. It's it's not artificial. It's water. Yeah. So, and put some pressure on it, and it becomes cold and crystallizes. Mm. And uh, I don't like the term artificial snow. It's 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 wonderful that now we can ski uh, and 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 not run over dirt uh, dirty slopes, you know, and 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 cut the mountain and things like that. that the technology has really brought a lot uh, po of positive uh, effects. Also, there's no, let's say, snow cannons, you know, to, yeah. to these uh, machines, which has a completely wrong association. <laughs> they, they bring fun to the people and, and it's okay for the environment. Mm. But, but obviously... 
but, but there is an issue, uh, I mean, I was reading some of your publicity stuff and I saw the word sustainability a couple of times and there was, there, 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 there is an issue for you because you're, you sell winter sports wear. Yes. But there's less and less winter these days. There's less and less cold winter with snow. Not really. No? Not really. There's a lot of places that hey, have I a lot of snow. I don't go snow. skiing very often, but I'm down in the Alps often <laughs> enough for people to tell me, no, like, we, we used to have snow here, but we don't anymore. We, yes, but yeah? this winter, for instance, you know, there was so much snow in, in the south, like never before. I mean, there's big changes in the weather. Uh, we will have definitely enough snow in the next uh, 500 years to be able to ski okay. and enjoy the mountains in the winter. No worries about that. No um, worries. One thing we haven't talked about, you, you, you've justified fashion as fun, as innovation, as a sort of a, a lifestyle kind of a thing, yeah? Um, in one of a, the earlier, in the first report, I think it was, we, we, we saw a parka, which where I come from in the UK, mm -hmm. a parka is something that sort of people wear to sort of to cycle to work in, yeah? Sure. Yeah? Why not? We had, yeah, but they don't pay 6,000 euros for them. Well, they wouldn't pay it for the parka, <laughs> but if you if you work on it like on a wedding dress uh, by putting stones on it and, and and putting like forty hours or more into into refining it, like in uh, like a work of art, it, yeah. it it becomes a you know a different story. Mm. Like you would you have an evening dress or a, a wedding dress of somebody who you know uh, and as. 8,000 euro is, is cheap for that. So oh. it depends on the occasion. You, you go with your, uh, you know, with your future husband, you go skiing, you want to impress him what you do. You know, you yeah. dress up. Okay. We give him that choice too, beside, you know, the, the, the normal guy who goes out and have fun. Okay, given all, that you're, given all that you're saying in these troubled times on the financial markets and with the, <laughs> with the global economy somehow <laughs> contracting, yeah? Uh, where, where, where are your big markets? Who's buying all this stuff? I would say invest in, in real things like good clothes. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but, who, but, 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 but I mean, who, who is buying your, your expensive fashion lines? Which parts of the world, which markets are expanding? Uh, Germany is, is still very strong. Oh, yeah. America yeah. is doing fine. Uh, the Eastern countries are very strong at this point, but also the Asian countries obviously are coming back mm -hmm. very strongly. So wherever people like something special, high quality and, and a lifestyle, you know, the sports lifestyle, going skiing is, is, is a certain uh, lifestyle for you know, more affluent people. Uh, who are not as fortunate as we are living close to the mountains and have it right next door. Yeah. So it takes, it takes money. But it's a, it's, a, it's a great environment also. And also a good show place for people to show off their success and their wealth, which I think is completely okay. Absolutely. And but, but, uh, to show you, uh, do, uh, to give an idea of, of the extent that you guys go in order to create the feeling of adventure uh, that you try to create for all your products, here's some footage from earlier this year when you went out on a glacier. Okay, this is very good, as totale, yeah. Okay, done, thank you. We're missing, so, we're so missing where was this yeah. feeling? That was uh, close to Piz Palu in, in Switzerland. And we want to do a, a real catwalk in the glacier. More distance. We must get ourselves right now. Okay? You just said we need to speed up, yeah. guys. Why were you, you need to speed it was up? Very it's very cold. It's cold? Yeah, the wind was picking up. Uh, it's expensive. The danger was that the helicopter couldn't fly anymore and Is that not how you got bring there? us down. Helicoptered in. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. of course. Mm -hmm. How cold was it? It was about six, 16 degrees minus. Minus 16 yes. degrees? That's and, why you had the, the girls, beard. you know, the, <laughs> yeah, the girls had, had not much uh, <laughs> underneath. So they, they did a great job. But it was, was a great image, you know, the high fashion in the high country. We saw you there as a photographer, yeah? Oh, yes. <laughs> you, you've brought this along for us today, just so we've just got time for you to tell us. So you've got, you've got a minute to tell us about that, Billy. Yeah, that was my first camera I bought as a 14-year-old uh, in a drugstore. Um, still with film, you know, you could open it and put the film in mm -hmm. and, uh, 
and then hide behind the next bush to to photograph wildlife, which I thought was the greatest thing. <laughs> <laughs> and um, then I I came close to a, a deer about 15 meters, and oh, I said, now I have a great shot, and I brought it to be developed. And when it came back, and I didn't find the deer on the shot because it's a real wide angle. <laughs> so I learned about wide angles. <laughs> so, what I like as well, I like the I like the talking about the winder, the wind on. I'd completely yes. forgotten about how no, in the old days sure. you had to do this and then wind on. No electronic part at all. Cool. All, all mechanical. Quiz. We're going to go at it very quickly. Where would you rather be? On your skis, in the office, or behind the camera? On my skis, behind the camera. Fashion is surface or substance? Uh, emotions. <laughs> <laughs> Exclusivity or equality? Um, I hate the word or. I'm an and person. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Fine. Do you know what we haven't talked about? We haven't talked about James Bond. And oh, here's yes. the question uh, that everybody always wants to know about James Bond and from a James Bond person. Craig, Moore or Connery? Connery, the classic Bond. Uh, Roger, I've done three Bonds with him. He, he had a great sense of humour and a, a great impersonation. For, for the British style, so my favourite is Roger. Uh, my favourite is Daniel Craig, I have to admit it. That's, <laughs> all that's all we've got time for with our guest today, Billy Bogner, uh, articulate and inspiring, a man who's very good at what he does. If you've enjoyed his company as much as I have, come back next week. Until then, cheers. Bye-bye. <laughs>